we have the back case studies. We also, um, Allegra had a question about um, emotional, what do we do about clients who are very emotional about pain? So I also did a little write up about that for you guys that I thought we could talk about as well. So, um, and if we don't get fully to it today, if we go through the lumbar one, then we don't get fully to the pain one. I can give it to you what I've written up so far, and then we can keep that conversation going for next time too. I'll just read the case study out loud. So the first one is a 70 year old female. She's super active before her back pain started and the back pain started. She has pain now in the back, the right hip and the right knee. She had a spinal two level fusion six months ago for the back. Um, The pain remained after the surgery and she had to have a cortisone injection in the spine a few weeks ago to help that pain come down. They don't know why the pain continues in the hip and knee either. So she has primarily increased pain with walking activities and pain with lying still. The pain in in the hip and the knee seem to come on together, but she never has knee pain alone, right? So if there's knee pain, there's either hip pain and or back pain. So or back pain and knee pain or hip pain and knee pain, but it's never just knee pain by itself. The pain in the back and hip come on, can come on at the same time, but not always. The pain in the back and the knee can, can come on at the same time, but not always, right? So the challenge here, and this is, this is a real client of ours, actually. Um, the challenge here, this person came to me saying, uh, I, I need to figure out what's going on. I need to get stronger. I need to get out of this back pain. I had this back surgery and then I still had pain. They gave me the injection. The back seemed to get better. Now I have this, but I still have a lot of pain in my hip. And that was going on at about the same time as I had the back surgery already. And then I get this pain in my knee and the doctors don't know what's causing what pain wise. So can you help me figure it out? (laughs) So I said, sure, I'd love to help you figure this out. And so I started just plowing through one thing or another. So if, if this I don't want to tell you what I did. I want to have you guys tell me what you what you would think or what comes to mind first when you see this person or when you hear this story about this person. What what things come to mind for you? So I started doing a little research um, before I got in a long conversation with an old friend, um, not about this case study, but um, I, I mean, just really quick, uh, I mean, labral tear, hip impingement, uh, dermatomes, nerve pain, and some compressed discs. That's, that's what comes to my mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I should give you a tiny bit more information. Um, her, she had the back surgery because of stenosis, right? So there was um, too much stenosis. So it was the back. It was, that's why they fused it. So now the back is fused. So technically there should be space for those nerves to exit. Right, which is why they're confused about why she still has pain. Um, and so, Kim, do you have any input on there that you want to share? All no. those things come to me. <laughs> no, no, all those, I, yeah. I mean, all those things. I guess I'm, okay. I would just start looking at her posture right away and see if there's something. I, mean, I have no idea what the diagnosis could be, but I would just start looking at her posture to see if there's some way things are off and if she'd had back pain for so long, she's probably got some patterns that um, maybe need to be unwound. But anyway. So I, that's great. I like, I like that line of thinking a lot because you're right. If somebody's had back pain for a while and has had enough back pain enough that they've gone in for surgery for it, they probably were doing something funky with their gait pattern and stance pattern and, what posture in general before they have that back surgery. Right. I, I hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's great thinking. Um, Genevieve, did you want to throw anything in there? I don't know. I, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I am with Kim. I would start with a postural analysis and see where, she, where she's holding and, and what's going on with that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, so great. And then back to sort of what Allegra was saying, impin discs, narrow discs, impingement. The thing that comes to my mind too, just to a little bit more of that back surgery is sometimes doctors are pretty conservative with the first back surgery for stenosis. And I think you've seen this in client that just actually recently came back to us. She had three, ended up having three surgeries over maybe a 10 year time period for stenosis and ended, the last one ended in a, in a bigger fusion, right? She had, um, and so doctors tend to want to be conservative when they go in, which I appreciate uh, because they don't want to do more surgery than they have to do. Stenosis is a progressive issue, right? So it's going to get worse over time. And they want to be minimalist on what pieces of vertebra they're taking out and how much they're grounding out uh, because they want to keep it, maintain as much stability over time in the person's body as well. So Allegra, your thoughts on compression. Yeah, if there's back pain post-surgery, there is usually, you, I would say it's usually because there's still some nerve compression that didn't get resolved in the surgery. And so sometimes that could be because they didn't open up the correct level or open it enough, which is a bummer. Usually they do a lot of diagnostic things like injections and things like that to sort of tell us where that pain is coming from. But, um, and I think they did in her case, but then when they did the surgery, uh, somehow, sometimes there's so much inflammation in the area and the nerves were so compressed for so long that even though the pressure is off the nerves, there's inflammation that keeps pressure on the nerves. And the nerves take a long time to quiet themselves down. So that's why they go in and do a cortisone injection next to see if some of that pain will resolve. So the good news is in her case that when she had the cortisone injection, the actual pain in her back did get better. So I was lucky enough to be seeing her while that happened, while she had that. I didn't have that information initially because she did it after we had start, started working together. But the other, and, and I think Allegra, you also said pain referral right? So pain referral. And I think that is exactly where your mind needs to go. Right? Back pain refers into the hip a lot of the time. Back pain can refer right into the lateral knee area and then across the front of the knee. So back pain can definitely refer. And hip issues can refer into the knee. And then Elinger, you did mention some hip issues, but I want to remind you of her age. She's 70. So at 70, there's one hip issue that happens a lot that you didn't mention. Osteoporosis, arthritis. Osteoarthritis, exactly, right. exactly. So if you're thinking, if when I see a 70 year old with hip pain, actually one of the first things I think of is osteoarthritis. And then if, if it's not that, then I think, oh, labral tear or something else or impingement syndrome or something else, but I, by 70, if they're having significant pain and there's a knee component to that pain, then I'm starting to think maybe it's osteoarthritis. The other thing that really refers from hip to knee, just from hip to knee, is the bursitis. So as bursitis, trochanteric bursitis can refer down as well, um, down the outer leg and into the knee. So the hardest part here is, is I think the best thing to do starting spot was exactly right. Both Kim and Genevieve, you agreed on that. I'm sure like, you agree as well. Take a look at what they're doing. What does their posture look like? And then you can start working on things. So, you know, you could start working on back stability and see if you're going to make any difference. And so that's exactly what I did. I looked at her posture and I started working with back stability. I started working with some hip strengthening, some knee strengthening. I gave her all, we went through all three areas. And, and then she had the cortisone injection. And what we saw is her back pain starts resolving. The hip pain gets worse. The knee pain starts resolving. So then I said, okay, it seems like your back's getting better and your hip's not. So that to me sounds like your hip has its own very special issue going on in it. And I think that maybe we should, you should consider seeing a doctor about your hip. And, and let's see, rule that out potentially. 
So she went back to the doctor and the doctor gave her a cortisone injection in the hip. Her pain went almost entirely away, right? So that's bad news for someone who's just come out of back surgery because that means that the hip, there's really something wrong at the hip. So when that, that a lot of times, like I said, those cortisone injections are diagnostic. So that tells us that her hip was a big part of what's going on by itself. It had nothing to do with the back, which means that maybe her hip needs a special treatment of its own. Um, so sure enough, she went and had an MRI x-ray of the hip and it was um, osteoarthritis at the hip and it was really severe. And so right now she's just out of hip surgery for a hip replacement. So it was, it's this, it was a series of events. So how did she get to this place? She, you know, it seems like the hip came on so suddenly, but, but I think going back to what Kim, you said about, it was the years of back pain that led her to the back surgery. And in those years of back pain, she was not probably moving equally on both sides. She probably had a lot more stress on that one hip and potentially has a history a family history of osteoarthritis and was maybe had down that path anyway, but a lot mm. of times it speeds up the process so that when they have another impact, it speeds up, sped up that process for her. The hip degenerated more quickly because it was getting too much weight um, and it started really paining, paining her and wearing out faster. And then, so it wasn't as sudden as it may seem and probably the back was talking louder than the hip for a lot of time so there's probably some stuff going on at the hip already but she just right. wasn't only, focused right can only man your body can only man body and mind right can only manage with pain in so if you have great pain in one area right the other you're not even really going to feel is that correct you can can be very true can be. that can very much happen that way yes or, you know, you keep associating the pain at the hip with the pain at the back. So she was having discomfort at the hip, but they kept thinking that it's coming from the back. And, and it may not have been that bad at first until after surgery, and she starts moving around. And then all of a sudden, this hip pain starts screaming at her because the back pain is not so severe. So, so I haven't seen her post hip to know if the knee feels better now which I'm really hoping that also her knee will feel better. In any case, she's not going in for knee replacement <laughs> anytime soon. So our next project will be strengthening back, strengthening hip when she's ready. She's not back even um, after the hip surgery yet, but strengthening hip, strengthening back, strengthening knee and getting her back aligned over that side of her body is gonna be a key so that we don't wear out the other side now, right? So, so that was that story, but that was a really complex, it's a really complex case, um, really hard to determine, but I just, I wanted you guys to see that so that, I mean, your thinking was right on track, but just to give you that, you know, information that how these people can present and what it might mean. Um, and, and even I'm, I had many conversations with her because she wanted to know for sure what was what, and it just, it becomes apparent as you're moving through things with somebody we've got your back strengthening your back's not hurting as much but your hip is still hurting you can have a back issue that's causing hip pain with no pain in the back so that's what makes it hard to know but then at that point sending them out to have see somebody about the hip is usually a pretty good idea anyway and I think that's where all of your minds went is but you can do strengthening for the back you know what the contraindications would be you can do some nice light work for the hip and see if that helps uh, to make her feel better. And if nothing's changing it, then sending them out to have the hip looked at is, is a good idea. And then you can put the pieces together from there. So, yeah. So hopefully we'll see her soon and I'll let you know how that goes after. Um, should we go to the next? But, yeah. Okay. So the next one is also a 70 year old female with spondylolisthesis at L4-5. So you guys all remember spondylolisthesis is the slipping of one vertebra for usually forward on the other in an anterior direction, which is anterior lolisthesis. So sliding forward of L4 on L5 is what that would look like. What she complains of is tight low back muscles and connective tissue. So all the low back, the fascia, that area feels really tight to her. Um, she finds it really hard to find and hold a neutral spine position. 
So she says that getting massage to warm up her muscles really seems to help her. She has numbness in the left leg, which occurs after a few minutes of lying either prone or supine, either way. She recently had a hip replacement on the left, but her psoas doesn't seem to want to be working properly. And she has clicking in her lumbar area while doing a Pilates mat single leg circle, especially when she goes into internal rotation. So she doesn't um, extend her left hip with gait, with proper gait. So this is, but the left hip just got replaced. So um, what do you do? Why do you think there's, well, let me see. Why don't you give me your ideas first and then I'll start asking questions. Did she have back surgery? That, this is such a long list of things, this poor woman. She didn't have back. There's, there's a bigger list. I didn't even put them all in there, but no, she didn't have back <laughs> surgery. Okay, but she's got the spondylolisthesis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, okay. I, again, I would look at her, but I'd probably start looking at... Um... <sighs> but she has well, what pain? questions do you pain? have? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so she had enough hip pain. She, the hip was a long time coming, but she didn't go out and get it replaced right away. Uh, and the reason the things I didn't put in here, the reason is because she was having a knee issue too. So the knee was on the other side, had a surgery first and then the hip on this side. I was trying to simplify, but <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, this is, I don't know. Sorry. My mind jumped to, well, she, what, what exercises can I do with her? She can't lie down. She can't go prone, but I mean, I think even before that, right. Um, I guess, would we do a post, like look at her postural assessment? Start with that. First things first. Yeah. First thing first, one step at a time is always such a great approach. And sometimes I look at these complex cases. I mean, we are getting these complex cases in our studio. So that's why it's nice for you guys to just think through, okay, what do I do if one of these shows up in, and they didn't wanna do physical therapy and now they're showing up right to me first. What do I do? You're exactly right. Take a look at them, take a look at their posture, take a look at where they are in space. Um, and then see what they can and can't do. Ask them, ask a lot of questions. I, I ask a lot of questions. You guys have all heard me asking a lot of questions. And, and then ask them to give you information along the way. But what, it, what do you remember about spondylolisthesis in terms of contraindications, uh, best, best exercises, best practice? Do, do, does anything specific come to mind? Is that the one that extension could be um, a problem? Mm-hmm. Yeah, extension is often a problem with, spond with the right. anterior lolisthesis, which is the right. common version. Mm -hmm. So okay. you would keep them out of extent, keep her out of extension, right? So does that ex explain to you why lying prone or supine might bother? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she's probably going to start arching her back because her stomach isn't strong enough. Right. So Abs can you have her? Enough. Yeah. So can, can you have her laying supine or prone? Do you think? Now that you put yeah. those pieces together, right? Now you know yeah. how Allegra, right? So if yeah. I don't want her extending her, it's, if I assume that it's because of back extension or an extension moment, right? So even, doesn't even have to look like extension to me. It could just be that when she goes flat, that L4-5 goes forward, right? So yeah. I need to have her lie down. If I was going to have her lie on her back, what could I do? Prop. I would put, go ahead. Oh, oh a, a ball, squishy ball, or I don't know about the roller. If, would it be too hard? Give her some elevation so she doesn't arch. Exactly. So, yeah, is that what you're going to say, Kim? Well, I was going to say um, you could put you could do her hips on the roller, certainly, or um, putting a little towel under her lumbar spine. But she oh, might that's... not be quite ready for that. But that seemed to really help um, someone recently that I was working with. So oh, yeah, that's and, and let them go into, you know, flat back, flatter back and mm -hmm. have her press her stomach into her spine and then into that little towel. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's a really, it's a mild, very mild way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a great thought, Kim, because what you're doing there is training her to, you're training her still in neutral because you have that towel and you're 
having her pull the belly in to create enough support to hold that neutral and you're supporting it from the underside rather than having her go all the way to the table, which is nice. And then the, so you could do that. Absolutely. Even bring, sometimes it's enough to bring the legs into the hook lying position and just not have them stretched out. Sometimes just propping the legs up is great. Um, a little bit like you were saying, Allegra. Um, sometimes just bringing the legs to tabletop does the trick, right? And then they're in up and teaching them to stabilize there, just in neutral, neutral tabletop, which is already a little more flat back. So that's similar. If they have no idea where they are in space, that towel is really helpful, Kim. Yeah. And then if they have no idea and no strength, then you definitely want them to wedge them or bring their legs and um, support it up into tabletop with something, right? So in straps under the bar or on the bar, uh, something where if they have no awareness of where to keep themselves and no strength to do it, then you really need to take the weight of the legs off and have them be in that flat back wedged roller underneath them, something underneath to really get the butt up so they cannot extend, right? At first, and then you'll work down to those other positions. Uh, yeah. So now we know why she can't lay prone. And prone, you would do, what would you do prone? Uh, put something under the hips, maybe? Like yeah. The stomach. the stomach. Yeah, right under the stomach. Yeah, tummy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, or the arc. Mm. Oh, Kim, you're muted. Sorry. Say that again. <laughs> or mm -hmm. have her go into quadruped. Well, mm -hmm. I, would, I would do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Quadruped. So those are, so you have now some things to, that you know you can do with her, right? Um, why do you think that numbness in the leg with spondylolisthesis? Because of the pain nerve. referral from the, sorry, go ahead, Kim. I was going to say nerve, um, nerve. Yeah. Compressed nerves. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if, exactly. So if one vertebra moves forward on the other, there's less, the foramen gets smaller, right? Where the nerve is exiting. So she, the nerve is maybe getting pressure, right? As that slippage is happening. Yeah. Okay. So um, it, if, if I gave you one more piece of information here, this would also put another thing around the picture is that she's a dance, she's been a dancer her whole life, mm -hmm. right? Um, not a hypermobile one though. Mm -hmm. However, she, she found ways to move more than she should even without that hypermobility, right? So that's the spondylolisthesis um, here. It, it can be coming on from a hypermobility point of view, but um, in her case, it wasn't. So it's more of a defect that happened with the facet joints over time, probably over mm -hmm. micro tearing and, and then moving. Um, and she has a lot of osteoarthritis, right? If she has a little hip replacement, she had a knee issue so she's got a lot of osteoarthritis in her body. So she's probably, unfortunately, genetically predisposed to the osteoarthritis family, which can cause issues in the spine as well. Uh, and then the hip replacement on the left and her psoas is not working properly. So her hip replacement, um, what, what do you think of there? Uh, I think arthritis again but you you mentioned that already yeah and what about the psoas not working wait i'm confused because isn't this the psoas it flexes but you said she has it that it's not going into extension very well is that what you said on that side yeah yes good you're on the right train of thought don't let that confuse you that's a very good train of thought yeah can what tight just so tight because so of the hip tight. pain yeah, so tight because of the hip pain and probably, so here's, here's something to think about too, is when spondylolisthesis, I like to think about it as an instability. You now have an unstable segment in, 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 in the body, in the central part of the body, right? An unstable segment in the center of the spine. So what, what do we do? What does our body do naturally when there's an instability somewhere? I'm sure you guys have seen that or felt it even at times. What does your body do if it feels unsafe and unstable in one area? Compensates in some way. 
compensate and what would be a good compensation for too much moving? For too much. Is Genevieve talking to us? Genevieve, I think, can you mute? Thank you. <laughs> I know what you're saying, assuming. Um, what would be a good compensation for? for too much movement? Oh, well, just limiting that range of movement. Limiting the range of movement. Yeah. yeah. And so do you think that could be so as tightness? Would that be a good compensation for too much movement in the spine? Mm. Too much movement in the spine. Would so as tightness be a good compensation pattern for that? Or a, po a possible pull on the spine, huh? Yeah, it could the yeah, it could pull on the yeah. spine, right? It could wear it, yeah, right. into, uh, its origin. Yeah, the yeah, pulling. Exactly. Yeah. Totally, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bonus. You got it. I think it is my anatomy here. <laughs> yeah. So what is what is the origin of the psoas again? T twelve. T twelve to T twelve two and. Oh, isn't it T ten, eleven, and twelve? No, you're right. Twelve no. can be, but then it goes. Down all the way L down the to the hip, into the lumbar spine. L two, L three, L four, L five. Yeah. Anterior, no. right? So belly side of the spine to the lesser trochanter of the hip inside the hip. Yeah. yeah. So if there's an instability in the spine, so as might be one of those big guns or one of those big dummies, the easy way we want to see see it at this moment, that wants to grip and hold and help stabilize. But a very tight psoas also has the potential to do what to a lumbar vertebra when it's pull really tight? It. Pull on pull it. On In it. which direction would it pull? It, anterior. Anterior, yeah. So which one was the problem first? Don't know. Oh. Right? Was psoas really tight and so dysfunctionally tight that it was helping her get into that spondylolisthesis or was so as so tight trying to protect her because there was the spondylolisthesis don't know or was so as really tight then because the hip was so dysfunctional in osteoarthritis also don't know right but these are all great thoughts right great ways to think about and to recheck through you know what could be or how it could be um, so basically now she's had the hip replacement so, which gives us license at the hip. We don't have to worry about the hip anymore. She's had a hip replacement. We can strengthen that hip. We can move that hip. She had an anterior approach, which is fantastic because we don't have any precautions anymore. We can work that hip now. So we could work that hip to try and open that psoas and get her gait pattern right again to get the pull off of the lumbar spine. But we have to go with, proceed with caution here, right? Because we now know that psoas could be affecting that spondylolisthesis and making it worse. Yeah, so we have to, but we do want to rip open that psoas. Now we can go to town, open up that psoas, find a way to do that, but we're going to have to strengthen her abs so, so much to get that to happen and to change her gait pattern, which she's diligently working on. She's amazing, doing tons and tons of work to try and get herself back to something more normal. Yeah, yeah. Any questions on that? A lot to think what about. I have to yeah. look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not where we're going. I'm not going down that path. And if I do, I'm going to oh do it. Oh my God. Yeah, we'll, I'll find you. We'll talk about this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I know. Yeah. I mean, I hope not. I, her issue started um, before, before they could have started for any of us. So mm. her issue started I young see. and then just progressed over time. Yeah. So, so the, the ballet you know, but, probably wasn't help, helpful because of the, that's one of the, um, I mean, just the, yeah. all that movement, the movement in early years, you know, can cause help with that, can right? Can cause, the spondylolisthesis is one of those things that um, it definitely can be adolescent onset and because of things done at a younger age, um, gymna gymnasts dancers, football players, like they're, they're falling into extension, right? That That's not great over time. Yeah. So um, 
th those sports at the intensity that a lot of people do them can cause problems later on in life. Absolutely. And spondylolisthesis is one of those things that shows up. The osteoarthritis at the hip and the arthritis in her body may really truthfully just be luck of the draw, bad luck and genetic bad luck and makeup as well. So some of it you really can't attribute to what she's done. Um, but yeah, she's a trooper. She's, she's gone through a lot and she's still working, getting stronger and stronger. So that's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Any other comments on these ones? Okay. So give me just a second and I um, will pull up, maybe I'll share a screen on it. Let me just pull up the other, um, the, the discussion about pain. So um, where this is coming from is that sometimes, so Allegra and I were working with a client and she um, got very, very emotional during the session. And she came in on a lot of pain. Um, she said, flat out said, I've had some emotional crisis um, also in my life. So I know that, and, and her, it was a neck issue. Her neck went into huge spasm and she couldn't unwind it. And so she was in a ton of pain. She said it was seven or eight out of 10 pain. And she said, I also just had a huge emotional crisis in my life. And so I know that that's contributing to my pain, um, but I just need to get over this pain. I can't function. I, I laid in bed all day yesterday. I couldn't get up. I didn't even know if I was gonna be able to get up to stand up and, and get here to this appointment. And, I, um, and she emailed me ahead of time. And I said, why don't you just come in? We'll do things that might help unwind it. So that's, that was the focus of the session, but we started and, I think maybe five minutes in, she just started bawling, crying. And um, and I and this is something that happens. Um, it happens a lot. It's um, so I did a little bit of research on pain. Um, and I've seen it a lot and I know a lot about it, but I didn't know how to articulate really, especially in that moment to Allegra what was happening and what the best approach was. What basically we did is, is let her cry and open the, open the door for her to continue to let that out, right? Because this is, it's a major release if people can do that. Um, there's a lot of healthy things that happen after somebody lets go like that and cries. So I was hoping that by letting her go and um, letting those emotions come out, that the endorphins would all kick in and help her lift her a little bit afterward, which can happen with tears, but also just help her figure out where this pain is coming from. So some of this pain, I really believe to be somatic in her case, which is a lot of times the case, she is somebody who has chronic pain. And so I did a little looking up about what chronic pain can do um, and what can do to physical pain, chronic pain versus physical pain and how come they overlap so much. And so that is what I have here, which I can share content with you. Okay. So I won't be able to see your lovely faces. So please feel free to speak up if you have a question um, as, as we go through some of this. And then I, I won't read it all through but I can send it to you so you guys can look it over. Sorry, I have some typos because I was typing very fast um, while I was listening to this, um, a couple of videos about it. Um, and I can send you to that source too, if you wanted to just hear more about it. But um, basically pain's been redefined is really what it is. Um, so it's um, people are, we're starting to finally redefine pain. The, the general processes of pain or that we have these receptors in our body called nociceptors, nociceptors, and they are our pain sensors. They're sensors um, that are just there for pain, for no other sense, right? So they will only speak about pain. Actually, I'm gonna look at you guys, sorry. I'm gonna not share the screen if you're okay, so I could just talk you through, and then I'll let you read it after, because um, I like to see you better. Okay, so, um, Oh, okay, hold on. All right, so we have these nociceptors in the body 
they give us information about pain. And then we um, take that pain and we process it in the brain. So we now, two people could have the same pain stimulus and process it completely differently in the brain, right? You, Kim and I could have the same injury, exactly the same injury. And the message and the message would be the same to the brain, but the, my brain would say, no big deal. And Kim's brain would say, huge deal. I hope not. Hopefully it's the other way around. Or hopefully it doesn't happen, right? But because we process pain in the brain. So, and they're finding now that pain can be really, really multiple leveled. So there is, it's multidimensional. It can be psychological, physiological. There can be social factors. And it depends on the person's mind and the environment around them. So it's, there's so many ways that people perceive pain. The interesting thing with chronic pain is that what happens is we keep getting, so initially that chronic pain is not chronic, right? It's just pain. And what our body does is we keep getting this pain stimulus over and over again. And with this continued pain stimulus, our brain actually starts to change. The brain structure starts to change. And then what can happen with that brain structure starts to change is even if we take away what is causing that pain, the pain remains because the brain has this pattern now that it's firing in a way that makes us perceive pain. So sometimes with chronic pain, the, the stimulus or the reason for the pain is taken away, but the pain remains even so. And there's no physical reason for the pain anymore. So the, the, best, the best example, they gave this example, the best biggest example is that phantom limb pain. Have you ever heard of phantom limb pain? Right, somebody's arm has to be amputated or their leg has to be amputated and they have severe pain in that amputated arm or leg. How on earth does that happen, right? The structure is not there. So in this case, we know for a fact that there is nothing phys physically wrong with that structure because it doesn't exist. But, we know, but the brain has had so much pain from that area over time for so long that it's changed its pattern, that it's firing, that there's pain there, even when there's no more physical issue, right? So that's one way you can think about it. So chronic pain makes such a big change in your brain that that's something that can happen. It, what can also happen is that if you have pain in the body, uh, consistent pain in the body over time, it only takes one little thing to set you over that tipping point. So in the case of somebody who is doing well and then they go home and they turn their head and then they get this huge neck spasm from just a little funky movement at their neck, right? That's not a normal response to turning your head, but it, it could have been that the body was already processing so much pain that that turn of the head was the last thing that fired and made them grab and then the muscles went, oh, that's too much. I'm done. And just grabbed and all this pain starts happening in the brain. The brain starts saying too much pain, too much pain, and sends these alarm signals out because it's already at this high level of pain and intolerance. So the tolerance goes down with the more longer you've had pain and the more stimuli that are bringing in that pain uh, information to the brain. And uh, over time, as the brain starts to change, that pattern sort of becomes ingrained. In the, in the brain and it's what tells you you have pain. So the answer is cut out your brain and we'll be, all be fine, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. So um, anyway, they gave this six truths about pain. Um, one is that knowledge about it gives you power. So getting some um, increased information about it, understanding how this happens or why it's happening all can really help. Um, remembering, the second one was to remember that pain is designed to protect your body, it's designed to help you survive. So we need pain. It's good to have pain. It's people who actually don't have pain, there's a few people in the world who have uh, no nociceptors or they don't work. So they don't, they don't have pain. They don't feel pain. Those people, their life expectancy goes down significantly because they can't get themselves out of trouble. They don't know when they're in trouble because they don't have the pain response. So that's not a good way to go. We need that pain to help us and protect us. Um, the third thing was pain is not just a physical experience. So physical damage can be one of many factors, but it's actually one of the least influential parts of chronic pain, right? So 
Um, and then that's back to how that physical injury can be perceived differently depending on the environment. Um, and they gave a great example of, okay, say you're sitting on a couch, you went out for a hike, you sprained your ankle, you're sitting on the couch and you're calm, you're in your living room, you're watching a movie, you wanna get up to get something to eat, but then getting up and trying to put weight on that ankle makes you like whew, go through the roof, you can't put weight on that ankle and you sit back down. Scenario two is the same thing, you went for this hike, you sat down on your couch um, and you're sitting there on your couch and a lion walks into your living room, right? You get up and you run away. You get up and you run, run, run away to get yourself to safety from this lion with your sprained ankle. And you have no awareness of that sprained ankle in that moment when the lion gets taken away by whoever takes it away and everything's safe again, you go to stand up and then your ankle really hurts. But how is it that you get up in that moment off the couch with the lion there and you don't feel any pain, but when the lion's not there, you can't even get up. up. And when the lion's gone, it hurts again. So it's just our body's way and our brain's way of prioritizing what's important. And that sort of falls back on what we were saying about the back versus the hip, right? The back was such a loud speaker at that time that the hip didn't seem like such a big deal. So, but once the back starts getting better, then the hip starts going, okay, me too. Here I am, now you can think about me or now you can process this problem, right? So um, the fourth one said that says that all pain originates in the brain. Every single type of pain originates in the brain. So the messages from the nociceptors are going straight up your nervous system into the brain. Um, and then it's gonna depend on how much, then the brain decides how much pain to associate with that damage. So that's why you perceive a paper cut differently than you perceive a broken arm, right? Because you're having more information, more repeated information from that broken arm that tells your brain this is bigger than a paper cut. All well, paper cuts really suck, I think. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so it's just a different response. Um, knowing also that pain is not imagined. All the pain is really real, but it is all coming from your brain, even though it's real physical pain. Um, and then pain is not an opinion. It's a fact, right? Pain, it's the brain's opinion. Um, oh, sorry, pain is an opinion, not a fact. It's the brain's opinion how much pain to have in order to survive. And it's not always right. So your, your brain looks at, the looks at the tissue damage, also incorporates how afraid you are of pain, but also what it might cost your life to get over the pain, what it might cost you in life to get over the pain. And your brain's making some judgment calls about what you need to pay attention to, like in the lion example. Um, but they also showed that they did some research on animals that made, where they had, I think they said they had mice that they caused a neurological pain in. And then when they took the neurological pain syndrome away, the animals still acted like they had that same stimulus of neurological pain because their brains had changed. They could see that their brains had changed and that pattern had changed. So, and then the last thing is to get rid of the pain, you need to treat the brain or the mind as well. And then they had a psychologist come on and talking about that. So it is a huge component of healing, especially in chronic pain, um, is to also have that ability to focus on what's happening in the brain in order to help people with chronic pain. So I can send you the source of this. There's, they have a bunch of, it's, a, it's actually an app that I found. Um, and I'm, the name is escaping me right now, but they have a bunch of just 10 minute videos that you could listen to um, if you were interested in knowing more, but I just wanted to, I'll share, and I'll share the notes that I wrote down with you too, but they, um, they had just had a, it was just good to be reminded about how important it is. I always tell people, you know, with spasming pain, especially that they need to be able to be okay with it, accept it, breathe through it, realize that it's not a life and death situation just calm their system around that pain and that really helps people feel better and um, so that is actually the conversation I did have with this woman who came in with the pain and spasm and in tears when she was a little more calm I could say you know um, if you can let go of some of the fear around you are going to get better this is going to go away it's it's something that's going to pass so as much as you can tell your body to relax around it the faster you're going to get through it um, but it's hard if that chronic pain pattern has been in there. Yeah, interesting yeah. information. Yeah.